If I ask one of our subjects what they did on September 12th, 1998, they would answer within about two or three seconds. And they can do this with great ease to the extent that we have the ability to check on the reliability. We find that they are absolutely correct. Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host and this is the 182nd episode of this podcast dedicated to anything and everything that you can do to help the workings of your own brain, even in those areas where our technological gadgetry is quickly catching up to us and in some cases surpassing what we are able to do ourselves. We're going to be talking in this episode about one of the most fundamental things that we do with our brain, something which is at the core of learning and something which is high on people's list, probably number two with focus being number one, that people are looking to improve about their own brains, and that is memory. We are coming up on Memorial Day weekend and being a sucker for holiday episodes, as you all know. I couldn't resist the somewhat obvious play on words of doing a memory episode around Memorial Day. Luckily, we've got a lot more to offer than ham-fisted humor in this episode. I'm going to be speaking with Dr. James McGaw, who is one of the absolute leaders in the study of human memory, including some very interesting people who have super, super memory and what it is that their brains might be doing differently from the rest of us that allow them to have these memory superpowers. We'll be speaking with him in the main interview. If you are not one of those memory superpower people and you're looking for a consolation prize, at the end of the episode in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, I'm going to tell you why people with a larger working memory capacity, short-term memory, a little-known and somewhat counterintuitive downside, so a touch of gray for almost every silver lining, that'll be in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick. But for right now, let's kick things off, as usual, with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So we're going to be talking about memory in this episode, but it is almost impossible to talk about memory these days without reminding ourselves that human memory has been radically enhanced by the fact that we've all got digital devices capable of recording pretty much anything. We can record notes to ourselves, audio on our phones, video on our phones, save these, upload these, do whatever. And in all sorts of ways, these augmented memory systems have very real effects on the way that we go through the world. Video replays in sports have changed things quite a bit in sports where that's allowed. And in the criminal justice system, a video can be oftentimes damning or free evidence depending on what it shows. No eyewitness testimony in the world says it quite like a video does, but there's no such thing as a truly objective video. Oftentimes you've got bad sound, crazy things happening in the foreground, inexpert camera operation, things that are fuzzy and out of focus. Despite its drawbacks, video is pretty much gold standard evidence showing what happened in a contested scenario such as might happen in a courtroom. But oftentimes one of the things that happens when people are shown video to give people a very close look at what's happening and oftentimes to make up for the fact that the video is inexpertly shot to begin with, the people being shown the video will be shown the video in slow motion. And what a recent study has found, this was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, is that in four separate experiments dealing with 1,610 subjects shown violent real-world videos, these were either surveillance footage from murders or professional football players doing professional football, watching action in slow motion compared with regular speed caused viewers to perceive the actions that took place as being more intentional, which really matters whether you're a referee calling a play a foul or a jury deciding whether an action was done in the heat of the moment, sort of a violent reflexive crime, or whether there was premeditation. These findings showed pretty decisively that slow motion video caused participants to feel like the person in the video had more time to act, more time to make a decision about what it was they were doing, and were thus more culpable. In four additional experiments with 2,700 participants, the researchers found that they could reduce this bias by showing people both the slow motion video and the regular speed video. This reduced the introduced bias, but did not fully eliminate it. There is actually at least one case where a guy's life hangs in the balance on the outcome of this. A man who's on death row in Pennsylvania right now killed a police officer during an armed robbery about two seconds after seeing him. He was found guilty of premeditated murder based on those two seconds which were shown in slow-mo. That is being appealed and ultimately the Supreme Court of the state of Pennsylvania may make a ruling determining whether the bias that's apparently created by seeing video in slow-mo is something which is too prejudicial to juries. The psychological effects of seeing actions played out at different speeds isn't something that's terrible terribly well understood yet, but the authors pointed out that there might be a point of super slow motion where the people are moving at such inhumanly slow speeds that they don't seem to possess any mental states at all. It's almost like watching a series of photographs, and at that point, the bias towards premeditation and intentionality might actually disappear or reverse. Further studies need to be done, and for now, the jury is out. 
Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Picked up a couple of five-star reviews on iTunes. Listener Suomi from Finland said, I'm a neuroscience student currently living in Italy, but born and raised in Finland, and I could totally relate to your sleep light in your brain episode, as I tend to get addicted to sunbeds during the months of darkness in my home country. Thanks for a top podcast, and keep up the good work. And listener Nick Tong from the USA said, I've always been interested in all types of research to improve the body and mind, but I don't have time to read all those studies. This podcast has got me addicted. I'm always waiting for new episodes to come out. Well, thank you, Nick Tong. We'll try not to keep you waiting too long. We'll probably be sneaking in a second little episode between episodes number 182 and 183. I've been hinting at that for a while, but the weeks just fly by. Hopefully you'll take my word for it that there's a lot going on behind the scenes here. The underwater portion of the iceberg that is Smart Drug Smarts has its little propeller cranking super hard right now, actually getting ready for a pretty big new thing in the month of June, which I will let you guys in on soon. We'll probably pop the cork on that first on the Brain Breakfast newsletter. So if you've not yet signed up for the Brain Breakfast, please do so. It'll get you an email a week or thereabouts and easy to click delete on if you just don't have time that week. But if you do, we will try to give you something worth rolling around the mental hopper a bit. The sign up for the Brain Breakfast is at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. I must admit, I'm perversely looking forward to writing a live dispatch from a bachelor party that I'm going to this weekend. One of my oldest and dearest friends is finally getting hitched this summer, and it's going to be a debaucherous last hurrah, including most of the antics that you would expect in at least four Bigfoot costumes. I was told not to come if I cannot bring a Bigfoot costume. It's that kind of event, but because I am the boring teetotaler who does not drink alcohol and I will be around a bunch of severely inebriated people for the majority of the weekend, something of the wildlife photographer Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, scatological paparazzi news piece will be coming out of this probably a what not to do with your brain or perhaps how to recover from self-abuse but should be a good time one of my friends who i've not seen in a number of years said hey jesse you know i've been listening to your podcast could you bring a bunch of your brain drugs to the bachelor party to which of course i answered yes i will certainly be distributing nexus and mitogen to the party goers probably preaching and making a nuisance of myself trying to not enable them to do anything more dastardly to their brains than they otherwise would thinking that oh you know i'll take a couple of nexus and work it off it probably doesn't work that way although the racetam compounds have been shown to be neuroprotective. That doesn't mean that you necessarily want to acutely test them for that purpose. Nexus and Mitogen are the two nootropic stacks that we have over at axonlabs.io. Nexus, the more cognitively focused one of the two, and Mitogen, a mitochondrial support stack laden with precursors for the mitochondria, and even compounds that encourage your cells to produce more mitochondria. You can find Mitogen and Nexus both over at axonlabs.io. Smart Drug Smarts. So I'm about to be speaking with Dr. James McGaugh, who is with the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory, which is part of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at UC California at Irvine. And among the many memory-related areas that he has delved into in his career is looking at the effects that emotional arousal has on memories. Memory is one of these things you can think of in several different ways. There's things like procedural memory, like remembering how to tie your shoes, and semantic memory, remembering impersonal facts. But then the sexiest kind of memories are probably the episodic, personal memories. There are stories that I tell myself about myself and have a huge impact on our sense of self and also predicting our behavior in the future, the reputation that I have to uphold internally. So we're going to be digging into Dr. McGaugh's work, looking at the ways that memories are stored in people in different stages of development, children versus adults, people with standard issue, middle of the curve level of memories versus people that have outstandingly good memories. He's been instrumental in assembling a group of people that weren't even necessarily thought to exist, folks who are now identified as having a highly superior autobiographical memory. One little terminology warning before this comes up. In this conversation, he uses the term affect, not to be confused with the verb affect or the noun effect. Affect is kind of the emotional resonance of an event with the person who experiences the event. Generally, you talk about things as having a positive or a negative affect. But all this and more, let's jump in now with Dr. James McGaugh. I think it all changed with the invention of the printing press. So once you had the printing press, there was no pressure to preserve these important dialogues of the past. I mean, after all, why would you spend much time memorizing things if it's all written down? Then, more recently, the computer was invented, and now we have cell phones. And you wonder, why do you need to remember anything? You can just ask Siri, or you can get on Wikipedia, and you don't have to carry around any information. So just contrast that with the world of the ancient philosophers and poets in which if you had to write it down, you have to find a piece of stone and a chisel someplace. 
That's a great point. Do you think that there's effects that we're not even really seeing yet that we might just sort of be on the cusp of seeing because some of these changes are so new as to how we remember things? Are we basically creating cognitive deficits in ourselves by relying so heavily on our technologies? Well, it may be deficits of a kind, but it's also a new knowledge of some kind. That is, should we be criticized because we learn how to use a cell phone? Should we be criticized because we're forced to learn how to type in order to use a computer or, or a cell phone? Every time we lose something like that, we're forced to gain some other technology. I don't know that it balances out, but it's not as though we're losing a skills. It's not as though we're dropping important skills and thereby diminishing the brain. Things change. Tell me about some of your work with the significance of certain memories, why some things stick in our heads and others are gone 20 minutes or even 20 seconds later. Yeah, this is an ancient concern. First of all, let me assert a premise, which I don't think anybody will doubt, and that is a memory is our most important ability. Memories are us. And memory are not about the past. Memories are about the future. The reason we have memory is in order to be able to predict what's going to happen to us in the future and do something about it. And so it is a puzzle then that as we go through life, most of the experiences that we have are not retained. They're just not. For example, if you're wearing shoes right now, I can direct your attention to the pressure on your left foot that's given by the shoe. And you would never remember that if I didn't draw your attention to it. All kinds of things are just rapidly forgotten, but some things are remembered and they're remembered well. All right, I'll give you two major reasons why they're remembered. One is repetition. Since it's been studied in a latter part of the 19th century and up until now, there's no doubt it's one of the strongest findings ever in the history of psychology, and that is that repetition makes memory strong. And that's how we memorize things. We repeat things again and again until we get it right. And the other is that important events are remembered remembered better than unimportant events. So that if you stubbed your toe, you would remember that toe more than you do at the present time. And for most of my life, I've worked on the body and brain conditions that are involved in creating strong memories of unique experiences and investigated the role of stress hormones and the role of activation of very specific brain regions in generating that kind of strong memory. It seems like we're very likely to remember both strongly positive and strongly negative events. Do we have a particular bias there? No, we don't have a bias. It's just that sometimes the negative memories are more powerful in influencing us. It's easier to remember when we are insulted, when we failed, when we've had an automobile accident than it is when somebody gave us an ice cream cone and says, there, there, that's nice. And isn't that a nice shirt you're wearing and so on. They just don't have the same affect. But if you can equate for affect, Effect, then the memory will be equally strong. Now that's done and pictures are shown to people and people rate them as being slightly positive, moderately positive or very positive. And then other pictures are negative and people will rate them as being slightly negative, somewhat negative and very negative. When you control for that, then you find that ones that are very positive and very negative are equally well remembered. But you have to do controls to make sure that the presentations are equal in order to find out if they're equally well remembered remembered, and they are. It seems like there's been a lot of recent research into proper forgetting, how the brain intentionally clears up no longer needed memories to make space for new learning. Tell us about the balance between acquisition of new learning and correct forgetting. Well, I think what we can do is to learn. And I can't give you a magic formula and saying, oh, I want you to think about this and then forget about it. What you can do is deliberately try to avoid thinking about it, and then you decrease the repetition. I think it's a pretty good idea if you don't think about the names of any president for the next couple of weeks. If you can avoid doing that, of thinking about them, then you're going to avoid rehearsing and rehearsing makes things strong. But there isn't any magic way that you can just say, boy, I had a bad argument with somebody. I think I'll just decide to forget that. You can't do that. So the suggestion that there is, it may be slightly misleading because the only way that I know of that you can, without physiological intervention, the only way that I know of is simply to avoid doing something and focus other things and let it rest. And that's an expression that we use, isn't it? We just say, okay, let it rest. Now, there are treatments, however, the things that we can do that will impair memory, but uh, that involves physiological treatments. And that's a different story. Can you tell us about some of those, especially treatments that are based on isolating certain memories, not generally worsening a person's memory, but trying to be fairly memory specific. 
Let's suppose for a moment I wanted to erase your memory of this discussion that we're having. That seems unlikely, doesn't it? You might forget it slowly so that two weeks from now we won't remember too much about what was said. But if you were to have an electroconvulsive shock treatment immediately after we said goodbye, then your odds of remembering it very well go down considerably so that if one can create amnesia by the use of an electroconvulsive shock treatment, that's one thing that can be done. We do that routinely in animals and with other treatments as well. For example, we have this discussion, and if I should give you a beta blocker, that is a, a drug that's used for heart treatment, if I should give that to you immediately after we finish, that would weaken your memory of it. And why? Because adrenaline, which is what beta blockers block, adrenaline and noradrenaline, play a role in strengthening the memory, and they do it for some time even after the experience is over. So if you have an experience and the experience is sufficiently exciting, that will cause the release of adrenaline in the body and noradrenaline in the brain. Those increases will cause an increase in the memory that is stored. It's called consolidation. These will influence the consolidation. And as long as the increases in adrenaline and noradrenaline occur within about a half an hour, there will be a stronger memory. The reverse then is if you have the experience and you get a treatment, a strong treatment with a beta blocker, then that will block the formation of the memory. So you can make memories strong or you can make memories weak. And that's been the focus of much of my research. What have been some of the methodologies in those studies? Well, a lot. Let me start with the animal, then I'll tell you some human experiments. With the animal experiments, what we do is train animals on a little task in which they simply walk into an alley. And as they reach a certain point in the alley, they get a little mild shock to their feet. We put them back the next day at the start of the alley and ask them, would you like to walk down the alley? Well, uh, they might like to walk down after waiting for a minute because they remember that they got a shock the previous day. But if on the first day we give them an injection adrenaline immediately after that training trial, they won't go back the next day into that area for several minutes, maybe four, five, ten minutes, showing that they have stronger memory of having received the shock because we give the booster of adrenaline, which they would have given to themselves if it were a stronger shock. Then we do the opposite. We train them and give them a stronger shock. And then if we give a drug that blocks the action of adrenaline, which is a beta blocker, then that will prevent the added effect of the increased shock. So we can make a strong memory or a weak memory or no memory just by varying the level of adrenaline and the blocker of adrenaline. Now, the next step is to figure out how this works in the brain. So on the basis of a lot of preliminary work, we got the idea that adrenaline acts by turning on a very specific region of the brain called the amygdala, which is in the temporal lobes of the brain right in from the ears on either side uh, towards the middle of the brain. And so what we did then was to train animals and inject them with a little needle down into their brains and inject a small amount of norepinephrine, which is the first cousin of adrenaline. And we did that immediately after they're trained and we could produce very significant enhancement of the animal's memory as long as that was administered within, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes after the learning occurred. We did the reverse of that. We trained animals and put them in the beta blocker, and we could prevent the learning from occurring. So we did lots of experiments of that kind in which we manipulated the level of noradrenaline in this very specific region of the brain to investigate its effect, its effect on the consolidation of memories that were created just shortly before the injection. And what the injection showed was that we could regulate the degree of, of fixation or consolidation or making firm the memories which were just established. I'm wondering how far that ability to disrupt the formation of memories. can think of spy movie scenarios where somebody could get a piece of information out of you and then keep you from being able to remember that you divulged something. But in human testing, how extreme is that? Does the memory eraser really work that predictably? Well, this is all time dependent. Yeah. So if the treatment is applied immediately after the learning, there'll be a maximum effect. If it's given several hours later, it'll be ineffective. 
active. So there's a gradient that is induced by these treatments. So it's not possible just to take an established memory. For example, tomorrow you decide that you don't want to remember this discussion today and so you take a pill and get rid of it. That's not going to happen. If you want to eliminate the memory, you'd have to take a beta blocker instantly after we finish with this discussion right here. Even if you waited a half an hour, that's too late because the memory of this will have been consolidated by that time. So you're dealing with a time-dependent fixation of memory after an experience. What's actually going on during that consolidation process within the brain? We know a little bit about it. So here's the sequence that we believe occurs, that as you have the experience, the experience releases adrenaline and cortisol. And it takes a while for the cortisol to become active, but adrenaline becomes active right away in order to influence the experience. So in human subjects, we've done the same kind of experiments that we did with animals. We trained subjects and gave them beta blockers, and we found that that dampened the memory of things that they have just learned. And also we did that with cortisol as well. So that's the beginning of an understanding. Now, what it does, it goes up into the brain and activates this region that I mentioned. It's an almond-shaped structure called the amygdala. There, that almond structure integrates the influence of both cortisol and epinephrine, which turn on the amygdala. If the amygdala gets turned on, then it has projections to many regions of the brain that are involved in processing and storing that information. So it's an amplifying system. It gets turned on and then it sends its projections and in effect it says, hey, something really important happened. Make a memory. we got to keep that memory. And so that can be regulated by activation of the amygdala. And in our experiments, what we've done is to influence the amygdala and show that memory has changed. Also, in human subjects who lack an amygdala, and there is a disease called urbach vita disease that some humans have in which the amygdala is lacking. And those those people do not show stronger memory following emotional experiences. And yet they do form the same amount of memory as regular folks? Yeah, for regular memories, they're just like everybody else. But if something very powerful that happens to them, they don't remember that any stronger than an ordinary experience calls in the question what your autobiographical memory, sort of your identity memories would be like if a trip to the grocery store was just as likely to get recorded for the long term as like a big fight you had with your dad or something. That'd be a different kind of life, wouldn't it? Yeah, it really would. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about autobiographical memory in particular and how that ties in with our sense of identity and who we feel like we are at any given moment? Well, I'll say two things. One is our autobiographical experiences create who we are. We live in a world which has been created by the experiences that we personally have, our personal record of our lives, our personal aspirations, our accumulation, that's all us. And we draw on that to remember the past. That's why we call it autobiographical. But they create us. They create our personalities. They create what it is that we want to do, what it is that we expect to do, because all of these memories converge to create who we are. Now, 17 years ago, a woman contacted me to say that she had a memory problem. And I emailed and I wrote back and I said, well, this is a research institute, not a clinic. I can direct you to a clinic. And she said, oh, no, I think uh, we should meet because I don't forget. Well, we met and we studied her for many years. But don't forget what she meant was I don't forget my autobiographical experiences. She does not forget the events that shaped her life. She doesn't remember things that are not autobiographical any better than the rest of us do. But as far as the personal experiences shaped her life, She can remember the day on which they occurred, the date on which they occurred, what happened on the day for almost any day of her life since she was 13 years old. After we studied her for a while, we came to know other people like that. And now we have accumulated approximately 60 individuals who have what we call highly superior autobiographical memory, which means that they have a very strong, actually uncanny ability to remember what happened on most of the days of their life since they were were maybe 10 or 12 or 13 year old. They know what happened on a particular date and they can do this with great ease. If I ask one of our subjects what they did on September 12, 1998, they would answer within about two or three seconds. And to the extent that we have the ability to check on the reliability or the validity of their assertion, we find that they are absolutely correct in what they assert. 
So this is a new category, people that have only been studied less than 20 years now. And we are using these subjects as a window into understanding unusual memory, which will give us more insights into how the brain works to create and preserve autobiographical experiences. Okay, so I'm going to ask what I'm sure is a stupid question here. I mean, I I feel like we all know the answer to this one, but it's interesting that the answer is what it is. Can memory fill up? Is there an upper limit on the amount of episodic memories that a person could conceivably store? Well, I don't think it'll ever fill up. You know, we have literally billions and billions of nerve cells, and each of those has at least 10,000 connections. So there's no capacity limitation. I wonder how that plays into autobiographical memory. I think I should point out that the autobiographical memory doesn't always consist of as many details as you might think. Think of it as what you and I remember about yesterday. You don't remember every single second of yesterday. You remember of events that occurred, sequences of events. And if I interviewed you about yesterday, you'd be able to tell me quite a bit, but you wouldn't tell me second by second, and you wouldn't tell me about all of the experiences. You wouldn't be able to tell me about all of the auditory signals that you heard throughout the day. You might say, oh, I heard a tune. It'd be like the cliff notes version of the day. Yeah. And so these people memory, let's say of 10 years ago, usually about as strong as our memory of yesterday, but no stronger. It's just that over time, we forget our autobiographical experiences for the most part, and they don't. So one way to look at it is that they're not very good at forgetting. And for some of them, that is a problem because they have or may have had some very unpleasant experiences and they wish that they couldn't forget them. And that's the reason some people contacted me because they have these very strong, unpleasant autobiographical experiences and say, please help me do something to get rid of them. And of course, if they're old, there's nothing that I can suggest, nor would I, because we're a research institute, not a clinic. I imagine that you're probably getting a lot of questions in the last decade or so about post-traumatic stress disorder, which definitely touches on what you were just talking about. I mean, that seems like it's an active area of research right now. Let me say something about that. Let's go back to what I said about the strong experiences leading to the release of epinephrine, which makes then strong memories. So that's well worked out both with animal and human research. Well, a number of years ago, I got a call from Dr. Roger Pittman at Harvard University, and he said he'd been reading this research research and he wanted to talk with me about its implication for post-traumatic stress disorder. So we got together and talked about it and then he went back to Harvard and did the following study. He had nurses stationed at the major hospitals in Boston, and when people came in with an injury or they they may have had an automobile accident, they may have been mugged, they may have been raped, they may have had a bad fall, something of the kind, and they were asked if they would like to participate in his study. If they agreed, half of them were put on a placebo and half of them were put on a beta blocker. And then two months later, he studied them for signs of PTSD, and the subjects that were put on a beta blocker as quickly as possible after the accident or injury had fewer signs of post-traumatic stress disorder than the ones that were put on a placebo, suggesting that what we have found with animal and human research applied then to the development of post-traumatic stress and suggested a possible way of preventing the development of post-traumatic stress disorder if subjects could be treated sufficiently early on after the experience. And that kind of research is ongoing at the present time with people continuing to investigate the role of beta blockers and other treatments to try to prevent the development of post-traumatic stress disorder. Are there downsides to taking a a beta blocker that would make that not something that somebody would want to necessarily take cavalierly or prophylactically? Not that we can see in our research. There have been a lot of published experiments by other investigators of memory in people who ordinarily take beta blockers, but they're just studying rote memory, for example, in a laboratory. How good are you learning nonsense syllables and things of that kind? And the beta blocker doesn't appear to do anything because what the beta blocker does is prevent the enhancing effect of an important experience. So I would guess, although I have no data on this at all, I would guess that people who are on beta blockers are not going to have as good memory as they would like when their daughter gets married, the birth of a grandchild. That may not be remembered as well by people who are on beta blockers as people who are not, but that has not been investigated. 
What is the scientific consensus now on why autobiographical memory starts when it starts for people? Most of us have our first memory around four or five years of age, whatever it might be. But why does it start then? I think the other question is the same question, but I just turn it around. Why is it that we don't have memories of the first four years of our life? And there are various hypotheses about that. Some are purely just biological, that the nerve cells are not mature enough to hold that information for a period of time. There is evidence that new nerve cells in regions of the brain that are important for memory are grown during that period of time, and the ones that were involved in the initial learning are no longer used. So there are lots of hypotheses of that kind, but the truth is that we do not have a very powerful, well-understood, and well-supported understanding of why it is that we have what's called infantile amnesia. That is, we don't have memory of the first, let's say, four years of our lives. But after that, autobiographical memory that last kicks in, we're currently studying young children for their autobiographical memory, and we've identified several who are, say, eight or nine years old who have remarkable memories of what they did and what they experienced when they were five, six, and seven years old. Strong autobiographical memory is not something that's restricted to adults. It can also be found in children, and when it is found, it is truly remarkable. We have eight-year-olds who can remember day by day of what was going on when they were five, six, and seven years old. We even had a a set of twins. They're now 13 years old, but we studied them when they were younger. And these are identical twins, one of whom has the ability and the other one does not. And you can imagine the disagreements that probably occur in the lives of these children. Do people in the real world with this ability tend to use it for anything? Is it something that they're able to use to their advantage or just kind of like one of those things like being able to wiggle your ears that's interesting but doesn't really matter? I think and we have yet to determine it. I hadn't thought of it been like wiggling your ears, but it may well be more like that because in our research, we haven't identified a strong advantage that occurs to people who have this ability other than being able to recall a lot and to entertain their friends and neighbors. Uh, One of them was on Jeopardy for 28 weeks, which is pretty good. But some of them have even asked me repeatedly, please tell me what I can do with this. Now, let's go back, though. Let's suppose that we lived in a more primitive world. You see, now we're all organized. We have cell phones. We have computers. We have transportation. We have everything which is well organized for us. And so there's no pressure for us to remember what happened in the past to the extent that we probably used to in the past. So I would ask the rhetorical question, I go back to the 12th century. Would this have been an advantage to anyone in the 12th century before the invention of the printing press, before there were newspapers, before there were computers, before there were cell phones. Oh, yes, I remember we did that on June 13th, and that's when the battle was occurring, and and that's when they wrote the treaty and so on. I can see some important value in a different kind of world. But in our world today, the technology for retaining and using information is so far different from that. It may be that the use has gone down simply because of the technical world in which we live. Well, if you've identified 60 people, I mean, even if you're only getting one out of a thousand, that's only, you know, 60,000 people worldwide out of seven or eight billion. To me, that says that this never must have been that useful of a trait or otherwise it would have propagated in the population and we'd see more people like this. The way I look at it is that if we could understand what's going on in the brain of these people, if we could really get detailed information, then we would have a new chapter of the neurobiology of memory because it would say this is something that a brain is capable of doing and here are the mechanisms that allow that to happen. And that's why I work on the problem because I truly believe that one of these days we're going to find what is going on in the brain that enables this to happen, and then we'll have a very different view of the brain processes underlying memory. Are there any things that you'd like to touch on with sort of the differences between episodic memory and more procedural memories? Sure. We can start back in 1890 when William James wrote his very famous textbook of psychology. And it is of interest to note that he had a chapter on memory and very far along in the book was another chapter on habits, separated memory and habits into two different chapters. Now, isn't that interesting? Wouldn't you think of as a habit as being a memory? Yeah. It turns out that the nervous system 
system honors that distinction. If what we know about the neurobiological processes underlying cognitive memory, that is a learning of facts, information, autobiographical memory, and so on, the substrate of that kind of memory differs from the substrate of the memory of learning how to do something. And so you can distinguish at least two different kinds of memory simply based on whether it involves a motor system memory or whether it involves cognitive memory. And that is a scientific discovery that was made many years after William James. I don't know whether it's by on accident or on purpose that he separated these two chapters so far and implicitly said there are different forms of memory. The implication is that these different forms of memory are based on different neurobiological substrates, and we now know that they are. And the third type of memory, I believe that's called semantic memory, the idea that I know that James Buchanan is the 15th president of the United States, but I can't remember exactly when I learned that. It doesn't have anything to do with me personally. Is that also neurobiologically distinct in the way that it's stored from the other two types of memory? Probably, although the investigation of neurobiological substrates of those two is not well examined at the present time. In human memory, the new techniques that were developed 20 years or so ago with imaging are attempting to ask that very question. If I put you in a scanner and said, who was the first president of the United States, would that be any different from your saying, am I asking you, can you remember what you did the first thing in the morning yesterday? Are those different things? And then you can ask, how does the brain respond? to those questions. And then you can make inferences about the brain process underlying a well-learned piece of semantic knowledge and its retrieval differs from the retrieval of something which has been a personal experience. And so those kinds of experiments are underway. That'll be really interesting to learn. What does the intersection between episodic memory and narratization or internal storytelling, what do those two have to do with one another? Because it seems, thinking about it, that the way that you were mentioning how our memory of yesterday is almost kind of like a Cliff Notes version of yesterday rather than the full data stream, that at some level we must be crunching this down into a story about yesterday rather than the actual raw data? Yeah, that's what retrieval systems do. Ask you what you did yesterday, and you don't say pain on toe, flash of light, loud sound, pressure on rear end. You don't do it. It's a narrative. I got up in the morning, I did this, I went there, I saw this, I did that, and so on. And we are storytellers because because our lives are stories and we retrieve in that form. The kind of work that we typically do in the laboratory is artificial. We give you a list of things to remember and then test them on you. Well, the only time that happens in life is somebody gives you a list to go to the grocery store and buy something. Most of our remembering involves remembering important events that occur or sequences of events. And when we're asked to retrieve that information, then usually we are storytellers. That's just the way we're organized and that's what we do. Memory is not just a curiosity that's kind of interesting. Oh, isn't that nice to know about memory? You know, it's kind of nice to know about how to paint and, and how to play a musical instrument that's fun to do. No, no, memory is more than that. Memory is central to our existence. And you can see that in its clearest form when you see people undergoing dementia. They lose their substance. They become somebody they weren't before as a consequence of moving on into dementia. Why? because for the most part, they're losing their memory of who they are, who they were. And without that, they can't plan for the future. So that's the importance of memory. Memories are us. And the terribly exciting issue for me as an investigator, also a very important issue for those of us who are undergoing memory decline because we lose the substance of who we are. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very much to Dr. James McGaugh for taking the time for that conversation. There was a TED Talk some time ago. I'm pretty sure that this was the author, Christopher McDougall, who gave this talk. And he makes the point that counterintuitive though it may be, the reason that we have brains when you get right down to it is brains exist as an organ to control movement. If it wasn't for the need for this control mechanism to control skeletal muscle movement mostly, that there just wouldn't be a need for a brain. We think of brains as being, oh, it's about thinking. It's about this big internal palace of creativity and thoughts. But no, maybe that stuff is kind of a byproduct product. And I thought it was an interesting parallel idea that Dr. McGaugh put forward in that conversation that memories are not about the past, but they're about the future and giving us the ability to predict what will happen to us in the future. Episodic memory is useful to the extent that it allows us to extrapolate and everything that it does other than that is sort of a byproduct, not always necessarily even a desirable one, something like PTSD being a classic example of memories that it would probably serve us much better not to have. 
And if you listen to a conversation like that, you find yourself slightly envious of those people with highly superior autobiographical memories. We've got a ruthless listener retention gimmick coming up for you that shows a bit of a dark side for good memory. So here we go. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So the old truism about working memory is that most people can hold seven ideas in their head at one time, plus or minus two. So if you're on the low end of the working memory stick, you might have five things in your head at one time. If you are particularly gifted, you might have as many as nine. Almost any way you slice it, more working memory is a good thing. But there are small exceptions. In 2005, there was a study published from the University of Chicago showing that people who are unusually gifted in their working memory also seem to be particularly sensitive to choking under pressure in high-pressure cognitive situations, drawing a blank and not being able to come up with anything at all. So what's going on there? Why is this happening? A team of researchers from once again the University of Chicago and this time Michigan State University decided to join up and investigate. The research was recently published in the Journal of Applied Research in Memory and Cognition. And what they found is that it's only a subset of the high working memory group that has this problem, particularly those people who are highly distractible. The paper's authors say that people that fall into this category typically lean heavily on their strong memory resources for advanced problem solving, but sometimes have underdeveloped cognitive control, their memory strength bred an attentional weakness, and when they get distracted, they can really fall apart at the seams. The researchers recruited 83 participants between the ages of 18 and 35. They tested their attentional control abilities with something called the flanker test, which basically amounts to quickly determining what direction a central arrow is pointing, even though it's got distracting arrows flanking it on either side that might be pointing in the same direction or different directions than the one single arrow that you're supposed to pay attention to. So nothing to do with memory there, but that got a sense of the participants cognitive control. Then they gave the people some tricky math questions, both with and without any pressure on them. Pressure in this case was monetary incentives, peer pressure, where if they did poorly, somebody else's performance would be at adversely affected by it, and the risk of public shaming. And finally, they added in working memory capacity. They had to solve these tricky math questions while every now and then a single letter was presented on the screen. So you've got to solve the tricky math questions, then at the end, say all the letters that you saw in the order that you saw them. So first of all, the results agreed with the 2005 study. The high stakes pressure environment adversely affected the performance of the participants that had the high working memory capacity, but it didn't have any effect on people with lower memory capacities. But the wrinkle that the new study was able to add was that the overall drop in performance within this group was pretty much localized to the subset of people that had poor attentional control, so the people that didn't do well on that flanker test to begin with. Jason Sadazan, one of the lead researchers in this study, suggested that if you hear about this and you think this describes you, you've got a good working memory, but you can choke under pressure. You might have inadvertently been leaning too heavily on your memory skills all this time, not built your attentional control. The two strategies he suggests are either trying to reduce the anxiety that you experience when you're under pressure, reminding yourself that in the grand scheme of things, maybe it's not such a problem after all, or by acting to boost your attentional control skills, for example, by practicing mindfulness or even just taking a walk out in nature, which has been shown to be able to help people improve their concentration. Just say no to dr- Ah, scratch that. Say yes to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Join our mailing list at www.smartdrugsmarts.com. Okay, so you heard it. That was every last little bit for episode number 182. If you can remember every last little bit of this episode next week, you'll win the big memory prize. But either way, you can tune in for episode number 183 next week. I'll be talking with Dr. Daniel Chow about a company he co-founded called Halo Neuroscience and what they are doing to improve motor cortex function in athletes and other people. Very interesting conversation dealing with transcranial direct current stimulation, which we've talked about a few times before, but never in the context of motor cortex stuff, which contrary to what you might expect from some of the gamer products on the market is actually where TDCS might best be applied. More on that next week. If you missed last week's episode in at number 181, I spoke with Dr. Zach Stein about the future of education. You can catch that at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 181. Getting very, very close to the website upgrade we've been hinting at for a while. In any event, have a happy, safe, and memorable Memorial Day weekend. Catch you back here next week. And as always, stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.